Welcome to NTD News Today. Here are our top stories. Robert F. Kennedy Jr. announces his running mate, attorney and entrepreneur Nicole Shanahan. A self-described progressive through and through, how could this impact his campaign and the 2024 race for presidency? Rescue efforts and investigations are underway over the Baltimore Bridge collapse. Find out more about their progress. Texas is still not allowed to arrest and deport illegal immigrants. The latest on a new appeals court ruling and how the Supreme Court could step in now. More details on a U.S. customs officer who allegedly discriminated against Shen Yun artists at Chicago O'Hare Airport because of their faith. A local nonprofit asked Customs and Border Patrol to investigate. Ukraine's President Zelensky shakes up the country's National Security Council. More on the change and what it means for the war effort. New Jersey wants to introduce the, to the world a new product, its own homegrown maple syrup. But something makes it different from other maple syrups. This is NTD News Today, live from our NTD Global Headquarters. Here are Stephania Cox and Chris Beers. Hi, I'm David Lamb, sitting in for Chris Beers. And to begin the show, in Baltimore, rescue efforts have resumed after the Francis Scott Key Bridge collapsed. Six construction workers who were on the bridge at the time of the collapse are still unaccounted for. Divers are back in the water this morning after pausing rescue operations last night due to weather conditions. The six missing workers are presumed dead. The workers came from El Salvador, Honduras, Mexico, and Guatemala. Both Mexico and Guatemala have confirmed that some of their workers are citizens. Baltimore Mayor Brandon Scott says the entire city stands with the families of the victims. He also highlighted the difficulties that rescue personnel are facing. That work is already dangerous, but will be even more so today with the expected rain, the choppy waters, and we all know about uh, the debris and other things that they'll be dealing with. So we also have to lift those first responders up who are putting their own lives at risk to be able to bring home uh, those who we lost to have some sort of closure for those families. While well, recovery efforts continue, an investigation is also underway. Authorities from the National Transportation Safety Board, or NTSB, boarded the ship overnight and recovered its data recorder. NTSB Chair Jennifer Hamendi says investigators looked at the engine room and the bridge and gathered electronics and documentation. NTSB investigators will return to the ship today and begin interviewing crew members. Singapore's Port Authority says the ship passed inspection at the time of collision. Transportation Secretary Pete Buttigieg says any private company responsible for the collision will be held accountable. Maryland Governor Wes Moore says the bridge collapse has a huge economic impact on the entire country. The Baltimore Bridge Collapse is diverting shipping and trucking around one of the busiest ports on the East Coast. The catastrophe is creating delays and raising costs in the latest disruption to global supply chains. Entity's Andrew Thomas has more on the economic impact on the local community and far beyond. The Francis Scott Key Bridge plunged into icy waters in Baltimore early Tuesday. Six people are missing and presumed dead. You just don't ever think that something like that could happen. I mean, it's, it's unreal. Uh, you wake up and you hear the bridge collapse and you're thinking, how? And you'd think they'd have things to stop that from happening. On top of the human tragedy, the collapse could disrupt the vital shipping port for months. The Baltimore port is one of the largest ports in the nation um, and is a huge economic driver for the region, um, but I would say is a huge cog in the wheel for commerce uh, globally. The port of Baltimore is closed indefinitely. The suspension will require rerouting vessels or their cargo to other ports. There will be contingencies for cargoes, so it's be perfectly possible that some of those cargoes that um, um, uh, can't be moved right today can be moved from other ports and other areas. But some some of the very large dry bolt um, activity will be very difficult to reorganize in that sense. So there will be an impact. Maryland residents are worried about the economic impact. Baltimore's already lost the best steel, the biggest steel mill in the world. Western Electric, General Motors, we've lost almost everything, like Dayton and Pittsburgh, a couple of American cities. 
That's our biggest money maker in the whole state, right there, the Port of Baltimore. And now your money maker shut down. It's gonna be rough. Uh, a lot of ships come in there. I get multiple a week that come in, and we tie them up. And it's a little scary, especially not knowing when the next time they're gonna open it up. When the next time you're gonna get a job. Baltimore is also the busiest American port for car shipments. What's going to make or break the state is how fast they get that shipping lane open so they can open back up. That's, that's, that's what it's right now. To build a new bridge and to tie that in, you're years down the road. But you've got to get that, and that's 58 feet deep. It's cold, it's muddy. The port is a crucial hub for General Motors, Nissan, Toyota, and Volkswagen. Andrew Thomas, NTD News. And we'll keep you updated on discoveries in the investigation there. Next, in the race for presidency, independent candidate Robert F. Kennedy Jr. yesterday announced his VP pick. A Silicon Valley attorney, entrepreneur, and Democratic Party donor, Nicole Shanahan. Joining us now to discuss is former presidential campaign policy advisor, Bart Marcois. Bart, good to see you again. To begin with... Good morning, Stephanie. Yes, good morning, Bart. This is an interesting pick to me because Shanahan, she's not very well known. To begin with, why do you think that RFK Jr. picked her? Well, you know, his whole shtick, his whole campaign is based on being different. And, and she's different. She's young, she's, she's vigorous, she's athletic, uh, she's very wealthy, incredibly wealthy, and she has great connections, but she's not a traditional politician. She's not steeped in policy papers and policy battles, but she is steeped in a lot of technical information, technological uh, uh, research. Um, some of it is a little bit odd. Some of it is cutting edge. And, and she is a pick that is going to energize the base of RFK Jr. voters, which are the young disaffected Democrats who are looking for something other than what they see. They, they've, been, they've been told Republicans are evil, so they're not even considering the Republican Party, but they know that the Democrat Party is not giving them what they're looking for. So and so he's opened what, up an alternative for them. Yeah, so based on what you've, you've just said, it doesn't seem like this pick has the potential to expand his voter votership. Uh, it, it does not expand his reach into the Republican side, but it does expand his reach into the Democrat side, I believe. Again, among college students, uh, especially, uh, especially people who, are, who consider themselves progressive college students and people, young working professionals, that would never consider voting for a Republican, I think they're going to be excited about this pick. I think they're going to look at her, they're going to like her, and they're going to like him even more because of it. Right. So do you think Democrats should be worried? Yes. Yes, they should. RFK Jr. was already taking more votes away from Biden than he was from Trump. In the early days, he would take three voters from Biden for two voters for Trump. Now he's taking away five voters from Biden for every two voters he takes from Trump. After this, it's going to be more of a five to one ratio, I believe. And fewer, fewer Trump voters. She's expected to bring in more funds. She herself is, is wealthy, but also her position and her nomination could potentially bring in more donors. Uh, how do you think that could impact especially swing states? Oh, I think it has a huge effect on them because, as you say, she has networks that go into Silicon Valley and into Hollywood, and those are the two biggest uh, sources of excess campaign cash that the Democrats have. That campaign cash is now going to go into the RFK Jr.'s uh, super PAC. I forget what he calls it, Restoring American Values or something like that. Uh, and that PAC is the one responsible for getting him on the ballot in all 50 states. And that is a huge undertaking. And if he's on the ballot in seven swing states, eight swing states, he takes the election away from Joe Biden. And he has been accused of being a spoiler candidate uh, intentionally, actually from both sides 
What do you have to say to that? I think he is a spoiler candidate, and I think part of that is purposive. Part of it is he just is sick of seeing politics as usual. But another part is his family shaped the Democrat Party for decades, and the Obama-Biden version of the Democrat Party has moved so far to the left and so far into weirdness and just bizarre things. If JFK were alive today, he would be a Republican and a fairly conservative one. He would be to the right of probably 30% of the Republicans in the Senate. And, and I think RFK Jr. wants to flatten, destroy that weird Democrat Party and make room for a more traditional, plain old liberal Democrat Party to come back again. Always good to speak with you. Bart Marquez, thank you so much. Former presidential campaign policy advisor. Hope we speak again soon. Thanks. Thanks. All right. And a Democrat running on abortion access has flipped a House seat in traditionally red Alabama. Marilyn Lands emerged victorious in a special election to the Alabama legislature yesterday. Democrats celebrated Lands' victory in the suburban district of the Deep South State. They have attempted to portray the state's GOP as too extreme on abortion. Alabama has a near total ban on abortion and in vitro fertilization services were paused last month after a court ruling equated frozen embryos to children. The win was a rare victory for Democrats in the state. Republicans hold all statewide offices there and a lopsided majority in the Alabama legislature. President Biden's son, Hunter, will ask a judge today to dismiss a criminal case against him. He's accused of evading nearly one and a half million dollars in taxes. The younger Biden says prosecutors bowed to political pressure from Republican lawmakers investigating his father. Hunter Biden's lawyers will appear in federal court in Los Angeles to challenge the charges. They argue he was selectively targeted by prosecutors in response to Republican criticism over alleged earlier lenient treatment. Hunter Biden pleaded not guilty to failing to pay taxes between 2016 and 2019. This while spending millions of dollars on drugs, escorts, exotic cars and other big ticket items. His lawyer has said he paid back the money in full. The trial is due to start in June. And a January 6th defendant has won early release thanks to a Supreme Court decision. The Delaware man is serving a three-year sentence for marching through the halls of Congress during the 2021 Capitol breach. The High Court will review the Biden administration's unique use of an evidence tampering law. Hundreds of January 6th defendants have been prosecuted on felony obstruction of Congress under it. The charge carries a sentence of up to 20 years in prison. It is the most widely charged felony in January 6th cases. Kevin Seyfried was one of the first people to enter the Capitol on January 6th. He was convicted in June 2022 for four misdemeanors and a single felony obstruction charge. Up ahead, Visa and Ma MasterCard are paying $30 billion to settle a decades-long antitrust lawsuit. What it's about and who is getting the money, Don Ma joins us to report. Police arrest a suspect in Georgia after a low-speed pursuit. The vehicle he allegedly stole may surprise you. More in just a moment, here on NTD News Today. American Medicine Today, featuring cutting-edge medical and science innovators and a medical professional's insight on political and social issues plaguing our nation and healthcare. American Medicine Today, Saturdays 6 and Sundays at 9 on NTD Television and other streaming platforms. As we naturally age, many people are getting zero amount of this incredible and unique substance. That's when we start seeing an impact in our joints, skin, nails, and even our digestion. People ask me, Dr. X, what is the number one supplement I should be taking? My answer is multi-collagen protein. People's reactions to me, people were like, what are you doing? What is going on? You look amazing. You have a glow about you. What makes Ancient Nutrition Multi-Collagen stand out from other brands? 10 types of collagen. It's grass-fed, pasture-raised with vitamin C and probiotics. It's proven to reduce joint discomfort rapidly, continuously, and persistently. 
It improves the appearance of crow's feet after four weeks and improves skin tone after eight weeks. And it promotes hair thickness, growth, and a reduction in hair breakage. It has transformed everything from my hair. Like, my hair was starting to kind of just, you know, come out. <laughs> and I don't have that anymore. My skin feels amazing. Call the number on your screen and find out how to get a free bottle when you order, plus free shipping and our 30-day money-back guarantee. And as a bonus, we will include Dr. Josh Axe and Jordan Rubin's revolutionary book, Multi-Collagen Makeover, free with your order, plus free shipping and free returns. I have implicit trust in Dr. Axe because the plan worked. I'm living proof of it. This is the collagen protein that is backed by clinical studies. It's what my family uses, it's what I use, and I know you're gonna benefit in a big way as well. Love the results or get your money back. This special TV offer is not available in stores. Call the number on your screen or go online now. Imagine a coffee that cares for your health. Expertly fermented with a 50 enzyme complex to enhance flavor and remove bitterness. Small batch roasted to a decadent medium dark, resulting in a brew that is gentle on digestion, low acid, and up to 90% less caffeine than regular coffee. America's first enzyme fermented coffee today. Join us on NTD Good Morning because we want you to stay informed. Kickstart your morning with the latest you missed overnight. Right, and don't forget that inspiration. Absolutely, so let's shine some light on the good news too. Tune in every weekday morning to NTD News. Ronna McDaniel's stint at NBC News is over. After just five days, the former Republican National Committee chair was let go after the network responded to concerns from employees. In a memo yesterday, NBC Universal Group Chairman Cesar Condi said no organization can succeed unless it's cohesive and aligned. He said McDaniel's appointment undermined that goal. The network said McDaniel was hired to provide a viewpoint from someone who had worked closely with the Republican Party. But network employees, including NBC's chief political analyst Chuck Todd, criticized the decision. The following day, several hosts voiced their opinions live on air. Rachel Maddow devoted the first half of her program to McDaniel, saying the decision to hire her was inexplicable. Some NBC employees say McDaniel has a track record of disparaging news media and launching attacks on journalists. Texas is still not allowed to arrest and deport illegal immigrants. An appeals court is now extending a temporary hold on a controversial Texas immigration law. Texas asked the appeals court to let the law, known as Senate Bill 4, temporarily take effect while litigation continues. But the appeals court declined extending a temporary hold. A judge in the case explained the decision, saying immigration is not the job of individual states. She wrote, the entry, admission, and removal of non-citizens is exclusively a federal power. Texas can now theoretically once again ask the Supreme Court to allow the law to go into effect. The high court previously declined to rule on the matter and gave jurisdiction back to the appeals court. The lower court is set to hold another hearing next week. And New York City officials on Monday started handing out prepaid debit cards to illegal immigrants. It's part of a $53 million pilot program announced by Mayor Eric Adams. The first batch of cards was given out to a handful of families. The mayor's office confirmed the program will expand to roughly 460 people by next week. City Hall said the cards can only be used at bodegas, grocery stores, supermarkets and convenience stores. Recipients must sign a pledge promising to use the cards only for food and baby supplies. But some have criticized the move, saying it will become an incentive for immigrants to enter the U.S. illegally. New York City Councilman Joe Borelli said providing illegal immigrants with services funded by taxpayers 
sends the wrong message. Mayor Adams insists the program is justified. He said it would alleviate a humanitarian crisis that has gripped the city. He said it would also save $7 million per year compared to city officials physically handing out food and supplies. The Romanian Mafia, now reportedly coming to the U.S. and stealing from Americans. This by entering through the southern border. Fox News reports that the Romanian Mafia is stealing from people in California using debit card skimmers. Suspects do this by placing a debit card skimmer over a store's credit card machine. Customers then swipe the fake skimmer instead of the credit card reader. An official with the Orange County District Attorney's Office explained the scheme. She said people sit outside a Walmart or a Target and it looks like they're panhandling. But they're actually using a Bluetooth device connected to the card skimmer inside the store. She said thieves get both the cash that people give them and the debit card number. The organization reportedly makes millions of dollars a month while working with other groups and cartels in Mexico. And Virginia Governor Glenn Youngkin had a busy day yesterday dealing with gun-related bills. He vetoed 30 bills that he said would punish law-abiding citizens and impinge on their Second Amendment rights. Youngkin also signed 31 bills and suggested amendments to six. One vetoed bill would make it illegal to have a firearm at public colleges. Another would have mandated a five-day waiting period for gun purchases. Another would have banned open carrying of some semi-automatic rifles and shotguns in specific public areas. And another one of the vetoed bills proposed safe storage requirements for firearms in homes where minors or people not legally allowed to possess guns live. Some measures the governor signed aim to prevent parents from intentionally allowing children to access firearms if the child poses a credible threat of violence. And changing tack a little, joining us is NTD business host Don Ma to give us the latest updates from the tech and business world. All right, Don, welcome. What do you have for us today? Okay, just two quick topics I wanted to talk to you guys about. And one of them is MasterCard and Visa agreeing to a multi-billion dollar settlement. We'll get to that. And then also I wanted to talk to you about Trump's company going public uh, on the NASDAQ uh, and see how it's performing. Uh, so before I get to those uh, topics, I have a quick uh, announcement for you guys. So I'm no longer going to be the host of NTD Business uh, soon because that show is getting a relaunch uh, with new design, a uh, new look, a new set, uh, new everything and better content. And it's going to have a new name. So it's going to be called NTD's Business Matters. So I'll be the host of that as well. And you can catch uh, the live broadcast of it uh, on Monday, 4.30 p.m. Eastern Time. I'm very excited for you guys to see that. I am excited to see that. Yeah, congratulations, Don. That's yeah. amazing. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so uh, let's get to today's topics. Uh, two of the world's largest credit card networks, Visa and MasterCard, uh, as well as the banks that issue these cards, uh, have agreed to settle a decades-long antitrust case. Uh, and this case was actually brought upon by merchants. So let me explain here. The settlement is set to uh, lower swipe fees by $30 billion uh, that merchants pay over five years. And these are fees uh, when consumers make purchases using their Visa or MasterCard. And on top of that, uh, the settlement would require Visa and MasterCard to maintain the swipe fee rates that existed as of December 31st, uh, 2023 for five years. And although per, uh, merchants have long argued that uh, swipe fees force them to charge high prices, uh, the settlement would not uh, necessarily uh, mean a lot in terms of price uh, lowering for consumers. Uh, but nevertheless, you know, this is still uh, welcome news for consumers. Yeah, OK. And, and also, we've seen the headlines in terms of Trump's net worth doubling because of his media company. Tell us what's going on there. Sure. So shares of Trump Media and Technology Group rose 18 uh, percent in pre-market trading today. Uh, and this is, of course, a day after after the very strong debut on the Nasdaq uh, yesterday. It was the fifth most trending stock on retail trader focused trading platform Stockwitz. And as well, it's the 15 most traded on the Nasdaq as of 940 a.m. today. Um, this is according to LSEG data. So the rise underscores the popularity of Donald Trump. Of course, uh, everyone expected that. Uh, and this is driver investor, uh, driving investor interest. But the platform 
Truth Social would actually need to show strong user growth to actually sustain this trajectory, according to some analysts. So shares of Donald Trump's Truth Social company, uh, of course, uh, Trump Media and Technology Group, surged as much as nine, uh, 59% yesterday in, th in the debut, and at its session high of around uh, $79 per share, TMTG's market capitalization crossed $10 billion yesterday at its peak. So very impressive there. This is an astronomical valuation you know, to, to any standard for a company that uh, potentially may or may not have the underlying fundamentals to go with that valuation. The stock uh, is at uh, nearly $70, uh, and the company has a market cap of over $9 billion. It's worth pointing out that uh, this valuation may be on the uh, shoulders of enthusiasm of supporters for Trump uh, rather than potentially a reasonable and sound business model. Uh, but that being said, the multi-billion dollar valuation uh, may defy logic to some uh, standards, but some may argue that, you know, the hype around AI as well, like for example, that has pushed companies like NVIDIA to record highs, uh, may have some parallels here uh, to Trump's company because, you know, NVIDIA also a bit deviated from its underlying fundamentals. Uh, in fact, for those that argue fundamentals should matter for Trump's company, uh, while well, the market hasn't really focused on fundamentals for a while now, so it's nothing new here. Uh, and another thing is that it's not the stock market that we used to know, for example. It's not the stock market of our grandfather's generation. All right, Don, yeah, thank you so much for breaking this down for us, and congratulations again on Business Matter. How can people uh, tune in? Yeah, I mean, just uh, watch on NTD uh, if you have it on... Uh, uh, on your TV, you can uh, watch it there, or you can watch it on NTD.com. Uh, we'll have it uh, starting tomorrow. It won't be live, but you can see it on NTD.com. And of course, our app, NTD app. Of course. <laughs> All right, Business Matters. Don, thank you so much. Thank you. Children under 14 won't be able to have social media anymore in Florida starting in 2025. And 14 and 15-year-olds would need parental consent. The governor, along with some lawmakers, want to protect children from addiction and online predators. For discussion, I spoke with Melanie Hempy, a registered nurse who founded ScreenStrong, a nonprofit that helps families prevent screen problems. Melanie, welcome and thanks for being with us. So do you think Florida's new law will be effective at protecting children from the dangers of social media, including addiction, developmental issues and exploitation? I absolutely do. I have seen for the last decade in this work and working with families that anytime you can raise awareness about this screen issue with teenagers, you, it, it's a win. It's a knock out of the park. We, this, this whole law is such a great way to focus on the problems. There are a lot of problems. <laughs> so it's a great way to really focus on it. Plus, I think anytime awareness is raised, people may not a, they may not be able to hit the mark exactly, but it's going to help move the needle a little bit further because we know that social media is really harming the mental health of a lot of our preteens and tweens and teenagers. Too much for them. So teenagers are also, of course, known to have rebellious streaks. Could preventing a teenager from using social media have a reverse effect and make them more determined to be online? And if so, what's your advice to parents here? Yeah, I think, um, you know, I've been doing this for a decade, so I, I understand that question really well. And it's a bit of a myth. Initially, if you take the child away from their social media, yeah, there's going to be a meltdown, which is actually the sign that they were actually way too attached to their social media, right? They're going to have a meltdown. They're going to get upset, just like if you take candy from a baby. But over time, very quickly, they start developing other habits for their social needs. Those habits... And those activities, as far as getting together in person with their friends instead of texting them, are actually much healthier for them. So we do not see long-term rebellion over this. And Melanie, I'm aware that you have a new course called Kids, Brains, and Screens. And what, yeah. steps, can, what steps can families take to regain this quality time and reduce screen time? 
So the very first thing you have to do is get educated. And that's why we came out with our new course. And it is a print book. So this is fabulous because most of the things today are online, which kind of defeats the purpose. So this book is full of illustrations and it's very engaging. And so it's a fabulous way to sit down with your child, help them learn about brain development, learn about their neurons, learn what's happening in their brain when they're on a screen about dopamine. And you start to get on the same uh, playing field, so to speak, and you're no longer the bad guy. You're saying, hey, we're doing this education. So education is really important. And then actually giving your kids the opportunity to be different and to stand out from the crowd. It really revs up their leadership skills when they feel like, hey, I'm going to have a flip phone. I don't really need a smartphone. I don't need social media. So we really recommend the education piece first, and we are thrilled that this new course is out. Uh, it is absolutely helping so many families. It can be done in a school or you can get the actual course for your kids at home. But then the next thing you need is a community. You need to find some friends for your children. So if you can get a few parents together to get the course, do the curriculum, get your kids on board, and then they become a friend group. All right, Melanie, thank you for your insight on telling us on how parents could get their family time back and be less independent on screen time. We appreciate it. Thank you. Facebook obtained secret data from competitors like Snapchat using a special program developed at CEO Mark Zuckerberg's request. That's according to newly unsealed court documents. This program ran from 2016 to 2019 and used cyber attacks to intercept and decrypt information from Snapchat, YouTube, and Amazon. Facebook employees, including Zuckerberg, sought ways to get data on Snapchat's growth, even if it was encrypted. The program involved installing software on users' devices to intercept encrypted traffic. A lawyer said the data influenced Facebook's product strategy and also hindered competitors' ad sales. Police footage shows a man being arrested on suspicion of stealing a front loader. The suspect led officers on a low-speed chase on several roads in Norcross, Georgia, Sunday. Eddie Sanchez stop. can be seen driving away hey, despite a police officer's attempts to stop the large vehicle. He's a former employee of the business the front loader belongs to. He was charged with criminal trespass, reckless driving, property damage, and obstruction of a law enforcement officer. Gwinnett County Police said it learned that Sanchez was terminated from the business in 2023. They added that Sanchez visited the business several days before and did something similar but never left the property. Up ahead, a new bomb and mass shooting threat against Shen Yun Performing Arts headquarters in New York after multiple threats at venues over the past week. Thousands of people protesting in Hungary last night. The latest about an ongoing scandal regarding the government and child sexual abuse. We'll have the details soon when we return. Does shopping for bladder control products have you feeling like you need someone to be on the lookout for you? Now you have your privacy back. We're HDIS and we home deliver bladder control products directly to you. We're always on the lookout for you. You get free shipping in plain, unmarked boxes. So your private matters, stay private. We understand how you feel. For over 35 years, we've delivered bladder control products to millions of Americans, just like you. You don't have to worry about incontinence any longer. Call now for your free product sample pack and over $45 in money-saving coupons. At HDIS, we're always in stock. We carry all brands in hundreds of styles and sizes. You'll be sure to get what you need, guaranteed. For your free sample pack with your free catalog and $45 in money-saving coupons and free product samples, call 800-701-6159. That's 800-701-6159. I didn't ask to lose my mother or to be abused at five years old. I didn't ask to be kicked out of my house with nowhere to go. Just can't. I didn't ask for any of this, but I did ask for help and Covenant House was there. Thanks to their love and support and to generous people like you, I got what I needed to take control of my life. 
For the young people who didn't ask to be put in unthinkable situations, Covenant House is there providing safety, hope, and a brighter future. Call or go online now for a gift of only $19 a month, just 63 cents a day. You can provide hot meals, safe shelter, medical care, and love to more than 2,000 young people who sleep at a Covenant house every night. One in 10 young adults will experience homelessness this year. Your gift can help reach them when they need it most. I didn't ask for my parents and my family to disown me. I didn't ask to end up in a homeless shelter. The beauty of it all is, is that I found Covenant House. The need is overwhelming, but your monthly support will make sure no young person is ever turned away. Call or go online right now to safeplacetosleep.org with your gift of just $19 a month. With your monthly donation, you'll receive this soft, comforting blanket as a reminder of the warmth and safety your gift will provide a young person tonight. Covenant House really helped me and really helped mold me into the woman I am today. If there's no help, Covenant House, where would I be today? Your monthly gift is urgently needed to reach young people in communities like yours who didn't ask to be put in unthinkable situations. Show them they're loved and not alone. Call the number on your screen or go online to safeplacetosleep.org. Another bomb threat yesterday, and the threat of a mass shooting was sent to the headquarters of an established performing arts group in New York. Shen Yun Performing Arts, a U.S. arts group founded by Chinese dissidents, is a top priority target of the Chinese communist regime. The classical Chinese dance group depicts China before communism. Some of Shen Yun's dance pieces portray scenes of CCP persecution still taking place in China today, including forced live organ harvesting. Violent threats against the arts group seem to be escalating, with this being the fourth bomb threat now in just over a week. Entity's Jeremy Sandberg has the update. A new bomb and mass shooting threat was sent Tuesday to Shen Yun Performing Arts Headquarters in New York. A series of emails obtained by the Epic Times state in Mandarin multiple C4 explosives have been placed, demanding a $58 million ransom with a Wednesday deadline. The email threatens to detonate bombs and turn the headquarters into ruins if the money isn't sent into a PayPal account by 3 p.m. Then another email from a separate account makes a mass shooting threat and doesn't ask for money. That email also in Mandarin threatens in the near future individuals will sneak onto the property, throw grenades, and shoot everyone on sight. Another separate email sent the same day launches into an expletive-laced rant, seemingly upset that Shen Yun reported the threats to police and media. The email chides the FBI and exclaims the agency isn't worth worrying about at all. The sender declares they will keep sending threats and eventually wear the police out with, quote, the boy who cried wolf. The email ends by threatening, then one day a bomb will really be put in a theater. This comes after weekend bomb threats in California and British Columbia at venues where Shen Yun was performing. The threats prompted evacuations and police bomb sweeps, but no explosives were found. A Shen Yun representative says the FBI has been notified and is investigating the threats. Jeremy Sandberg, NTD News. We've learned more about the U.S. Customs officer who allegedly discriminated against Shen Yun artists at Chicago O'Hare Airport. Multiple artists said they heard the officer telling his colleagues the group is illegal for practicing Falun Gong. Customs and Border Patrol says it strictly prohibits profiling on the basis of race or religion. A Chicago nonprofit group is now calling for an investigation of the officer's conduct, alleging he used Chinese Communist Party hate propaganda in his official capacity. NTD's Jack Bradley has the details. We broke a story earlier this month at Chicago's O'Hare International Airport. A U.S. Customs officer whose last name is Ho, a Chinese immigrant from Beijing and is fluent in Mandarin, allegedly targeted the performers while they were re-entering the U.S. after touring in Europe. Officer Ho allegedly told the dancers that they were illegal because of their faith, even though they are U.S. citizens or hold legal visas. Officer Ho is still currently working at the O'Hare Airport. The Midwest Falun Dafa Association, which is the presenter of Shen Yun is calling on U.S. Customs and Border Protection to investigate the incident. 
They said in a statement, we are deeply troubled by the discrimination and never did we anticipate that a federal government official, especially a customs officer, would delve into an individual's personal beliefs. Such conduct not only violates federal government policy, but also undermines the foundational principles of our nation, freedom of belief. A Customs and Border Protection Watch commander said that they're investigating the incident. Many of Shen Yun's artists have experienced persecution firsthand by the regime in China for practicing Falun Gong, also known as Falun Dafa. It's a meditation practice based on truthfulness, compassion, and forbearance, and it's been banned and persecuted in China since 1999. A Shen Yun vice president said that these threats are the Chinese regime's last-ditch effort to hide the truth. Members of Congress like Congressman Scott Perry and Michelle Steele have sent letters to the Customs and Border Protection demanding answers. Reporting from Washington, D.C., Jack Bradley, NTD News. And now we have some short headlines from Russia, Germany and other European countries. First, an update on the attack in Moscow. The president of Belarus, Alexander Lukashenko, said today the suspects actually tried fleeing to Belarus. They allegedly ended up choosing Ukraine only because they feared tight controls on the Belarusian border. Border units were mobilized and some military units instantly. Therefore, they could not enter Belarus in any way. They saw it. So they turned around and went to the section of the Ukrainian-Russian border. Russian officials on Tuesday said the suspects tried to escape to Ukraine. Moscow used this argument as proof of alleged involvement by Ukraine. Russia is still reeling from the Friday attack. Gunmen killed over 130 people in a music hall. Health officials said about 90 people remain hospitalized. Over 20 are in serious condition. And a leadership shakeup in Ukraine yesterday. President Volodymyr Zelensky dismissed the Secretary of Ukraine's National Security Council, replacing him with the head of his foreign spy agency. The move follows the overhaul of the military high command last month. No reason for the change was given. Zelensky said the official was being transferred to new duties, with details coming later. The National Security Council has a coordinating role on security and defense issues under the president. It comprises the country's top political security and defense chiefs. Ukraine is battling to keep up its war effort and hold the line against attacking Russian forces in the east. And thousands of demonstrators gathered in Hungary last night. A former government insider released an audio recording allegedly proving that top officials conspired to cover up corruption. It's the latest development in a scandal surrounding Prime Minister Viktor Orban and other top officials in Hungary. Protests first began in early February. It was revealed then that Orban pardoned a man in prison for covering up child sex abuse by the director of a state-run orphanage. Close Orban allies were forced to resign due to public outrage. And Germany's economy is now expected to grow by much less than previously thought. Leading German think, think tanks have reduced their forecast for the country's economy this year. They previously expected 1.3% growth, but they're now slashing that to just 0.1%. The upturn in economic output expected last fall for the winter half year has failed to materialize. All in all, the domestic economy has received little more than a tailwind. The German economy has struggled with increased energy costs after Russia invaded Ukraine. But also with high inflation. Similar to the U.S., the European Central Bank printed a lot of money during the COVID-19 pandemic, which led to higher inflation. And coming up, New Jersey wants to introduce to the world a new product. It's homegrown maple syrup. But something makes it different from other maple syrups. Two polar bear cubs taking their first steps in the snow. See footage coming out of a zoo in Russia's Siberia. More shortly, here on NTD News Today. More than just beautiful dance. It's a touch of the divine. More than just legends. 
It's the beautiful culture and wisdom of China before communism. More than just a performance, it's an experience that awakens the soul. Lincoln Center, NJ Pack, State Theater, Purchase, and Stamford. Starting March 28th. Tickets at ZhenYun.com. Hello, I'm Mike Lindell, and I'm here to tell you about my new product from my pillow. Towels that actually work. Watch this absorbency test. Here's another towel that we randomly went out and bought. Here's one of my towels with the nice design. I don't know if you can see this, but you could line a swimming pool with this. I mean, this is crazy. Get rid of it. Towels that actually work. What a concept. I'm interrupting this commercial to let you know you can get our six piece My Towels, regular $69.98, now only $29.98. Or you can save 25% on our brand new kitchen towels made with the same technology as our famous My Towels. Also, we have bath sheets, bath towels, washcloths, hand towels, and so much more. And the best part, with your promo code, your entire order ships absolutely free. So go to MyPillow.com or call the number on your screen. Use that promo code to get deep discounts on all my towels. And for a limited time, your order ships absolutely free. The ninth International Chinese Vocal Competition is scheduled to take place in New York City in September 2024. We are proud to announce that this year's panel of judges will include distinguished vocalists from the globally acclaimed Shen Yun Performing Arts. The prestigious Gold Award includes a $10,000 prize. For additional details, please visit vocal.ntdtv.com. Is deep sea fish oil really healthy? Due to pollution in the oceans, most fish contain heavy metal elements and radioactive substances. That's why it's so important to choose a pure source of omega-3. Puritan green vegetable omega-3 is made from purslan and perillaceae, which are rich in nutrients and minerals, especially vitamins A, D, E, calcium and iron. With natural processing and no harmful chemical additives, it has more than 90% concentration of omegas 3, 6, 7, and 9. It effectively improves brain power and is beneficial to the heart's health. Puritan Omega-3 does not smell of fish and contains no pollutants, so both adults and children can safely and easily consume it over a long period of time. Puritan Green Vegetable Omega-3. Greener, healthier, and more effective. Visit puritang.com to learn more. I'm Iris Tao at the White House, and we are NTD. Step aside, Vermont. New Jersey wants to introduce the world to its own maple syrup. A project at Stockton University is tapping the state's red maple trees to produce a sweet treat that they say is perfect for pancakes. If Stockton University in southern New Jersey has its way, the Garden State may soon be known for something unexpected, maple syrup. Funded by a $1 million grant from the Department of Agriculture, the university is in its fourth year of producing syrup from the 300 acres of maple surrounding it. They want to use a species of maple tree common to southern New Jersey. It has only half as much sugar as the maples of Vermont, the nation's maple syrup capital. The program is also training others to reproduce the sugaring process. And our maple species is also the red maple species as opposed to the sugar maple species up in Vermont and Canada. Uh, our goal is ultimately to create a model that we can bring to people in South Jersey and say, if you want to produce maple syrup in South Jersey, here's the way that you do it. And we can give them all the supplies and training that they'll need to do it and teach them every step they'll need to know along the way. Their project events are creating a maple syrup culture with some surprises for some local residents. We're also bringing a whole new culture to South Jersey. We have people who have never tasted pure maple syrup coming to our events. People who didn't know you get maple syrup from maple trees. How does South Jersey maple syrup taste? Yes, I think uh, we get a darker syrup down here in South Jersey and I think it has a more maple flavor to it and we also boil it over a wood stove, so I think you get a little bit of that wood fire taste into it as well. And you'll have to try it for yourself. 
What's next for the university's project? We are already meeting, making connections with um, local high schools with culinary art programs, and they're developing recipes. Stockton's Food Service is working with us to develop recipes for things like salad dressing and barbecue sauce. Um, adding value to a product by in, in, you know, including this little bit of syrup and yet creating something really special out of it. In the project's next round of funding, Stockton University will seek partnerships with the food industry and regional schools to introduce its syrup more widely. Water is one of the most vital substances you can take into your body, so it pays to get it right. Here's Gina Marie from Strong Mind and Body with a few ideas on filtration. Water quality is a major issue in our country. It's a source of toxins and cancer-causing compounds. The Environmental Working Group found 50,000 US public water systems are contaminated with cancer-causing chemicals. If you want to see how contaminated your water supply is, you can visit the National Tap Water Database and enter your zip code for the report. Bottled water is no exception. Roy Spizer is the Vice President of Clean Water Revival and an expert in water quality with 40 years of experience. He says that 40% of bottled water is contaminated. He mentioned water packaged in plastic bottles contains xenoestrogens. These leach out from the plastic. This can cause hormone disruptions and is linked to prostate and breast cancer. He also said that the water quality issues are much more severe and toxic than they were just 10 or 20 years ago. He said they started detecting pharmaceuticals and new heavy metals and chemicals like chlorate. These are from fertilizers in the water supply. Municipal water supplies have changed from using chlorine to chloramine. This is chlorine plus ammonia. This has new byproducts and requires new technology to be filtered out. Carbon filters are 30-year-old technology. They are in pitches and faucet mounts, but they only remove chlorine, a little bit of lead, bad taste and odor. Reverse osmosis only takes care of chlorine and heavy metals. This again is another 30-year-old technology. There are a lot of overpriced and underperforming water systems out there. Reverse osmosis filters out the good minerals along with the heavy metals, but they leave behind the pharmaceuticals. The best water filtration systems is the one customized to the water issues in your area. If you live in a farming area, you may need filters for nitrates and pesticides. In some areas of the country, uranium is an issue. In the larger metropolitan areas, there may be more pharmaceuticals in the water. The point is, one water filter does not serve all. The first step is to get your water report and know your water issues. As mentioned earlier, get your free report by visiting the EWG website, or you can order a test kit for your well if you have well water. If you're on a budget or just renting, there are countertop or portable filters that are available. They work just as well as permanent ones. And next, some updates from the animal kingdom. We start with an African Varose eagle owl. The king of a UK castle is preparing to take flight. Ernie has been flying twice a day at Warwick Castle to entertain visitors. But after 30 years in the business, he's retiring and he has certainly earned it. Ernie will perform a final flyover before passing the baton onto his younger successor, Bernie. At times here, there's up to 10,000 people here. It, it is a, an amazing place. So Ernie's just, I, I think, ready for uh, a, a few years of peace and tranquility. He's done such a good service. We seen him nearly 11 years ago. He definitely looks a little bit more weathered over there. A wise old man to teach Bernie. Wise old owl. <laughs> wise old owl. I should have said that, yeah. <laughs> This wise old owl has earned his rest, a retirement to the Yorkshire Dales National Park in northern England. And in a zoo in Russia's Siberian region, two polar bear cubs are making their first steps in the snow. The cubs are blind, weak, and weighed only about a pound when they were born in December. Zoo staff say their mother's keeping them safe inside until they become stronger. She's watching them and feeding them. Staff and visitors say that the female cub is more active and curious while the male seems calmer. Neither has a name yet and the public is asked to submit their suggestions. And over in a zoo in western Germany, visitors are treated to a special sight. 
The zoo's animals set, went on an Easter egg hunt today. The animals enjoyed searching for food, and zookeepers are always coming up with new ways to keep them occupied. For a pair of brown bear brothers, the zoo made special edible Easter eggs. They have shells made from flour and water and then filled with fruit and nuts. The zoo's southern pig-tailed macaque and dwarf mongoose populations were treated to regular chicken eggs. They were painted in a variety of colors for the Easter celebrations. Very sweet. Well, for round-the-clock original news coverage, visit us at ntd.com or download our NTD app. And be sure to stick around for NTD Newsroom at 3 p.m. Eastern. We'll cover more stories from the U.S. and around the world. What's happened to this world we're living in? Why? For the four years he has been on this earth, he has known nothing but war. Wherever I go, the things I see, I just want to turn away. The dreams I have, the stories I could tell, will they still be possible? This year, more than ever, I need a brand new world. A clean world. Where I can improve myself and be inspired. My stage can be anywhere and everywhere but it begins here. Nanjing World, a brighter way of life. Freedom is not free, and neither is the truth. In order to bring you the facts, our reporters are out there on the front lines getting the true story. Some of them served 10 years of prison in China. We've been censored on social media. Our Hong Kong printing offices were set on fire, and we've been repeatedly attacked by the Chinese Communist Party. But no matter what, we believe that you deserve the truth, and so we'll continue to bring the truth to light. Head on over to getepic.com and try honor journalism that is based in truth and tradition. We'd love to have you on board. Tangazo hili linahusu nja. Tarajia kuona watoto wakiwa na nja katika maeneo haya. Mambo yalikuwa bora kwa miaka mingi tuliweza kupigana na nja na watoto wachache walikufa. Lakini sasa mambo yamebadilika na kwa mabaya zaidi. Hii ni kwa sababu wakati huu hukame umeangamiza zaidi. Через війни та конфлікти ми мусимо залишати наші домівки і всі наші речі. Ми навіть не маємо їжі. Тому нам потрібна ваша допомога. Millions of children are fighting to survive due to inequality, conflict, poverty, and the climate crisis. Save the Children is working alongside communities to provide a better life for children. And there's a way you can help. Please call or go online to give just $10 a month only 33 cents a day. We urgently need 1,000 new monthly donors in the next 30 days to help the children we support around the world. You can help provide food, medicine, care, and protection, plus so much more that a child needs by calling right now and giving just $10 a month. You can help the children 
और बच्चों को भूख से मरने से रोक सकते हैं ऑल वी नीड आर 1000 मंथली डोनर्स इन द नेक्स्ट 30 डेज प्लीज कॉल और गो ऑनलाइन नाउ विद योर मंथली गिफ्ट ऑफ जस्ट 10 डॉलर्स थैंक्स टू जेनरस गवर्नमेंट ग्रांट्स एवरी डॉलर यू गिव कैन हैव अप टू 10 टाइम्स द इंपैक्ट एंड व्हेन यू कॉल विद योर क्रेडिट कार्ड वी विल सेंड यू दिस सेव द चिल्ड्रन टोट बैग एज अ थैंक यू फॉर योर सपोर्ट टोटो कोटे दुनियानी कंट्रीब्यूट फॉर शेयर द पुमोर Your small monthly donation of just $10 could be the reason a child in crisis survives. Please call or go online to hungerstopsnow.org to help save lives today. You need some help? Your tow chains are a little loose. Could spark a wildfire. I could show you how to secure them properly if you'd like. Sure. Thanks a lot. Any time. You should check out smokybear.com. They've got a bunch of tips on wildfire prevention. Only you can prevent wildfires. Welcome to NTD News today. Here are our top stories. Hunter Biden is claiming political bias in court today. Hear about his bid to have his tax crime case tossed. Recovery operations continue more than 24 hours after the Baltimore Bridge collapse. Entity correspondent Luis Martinez has the latest from Maryland. Texas is still not allowed to arrest and deport illegal immigrants. The latest on a new appeal appeals court ruling and how the Supreme Court could step in now. A new bomb and mass shooting threat against Shen Yun Performing Arts headquarters in New York. after multiple threats at venues over the last week. TikTok could be facing more trouble. Reports say the Federal Trade Commission has been investigating the platform for its data and security practices. Ahead of a total solar eclipse next month, New York is giving out thousands of eclipse viewing glasses so people can protect their eyes during the rare phenomenon. This is NTD News Today, live from our NTD Global Headquarters. Here are Stephania Cox and Chris Beers. Hi, I'm David Lamb, sitting in for Chris Beers. And we have some breaking news. In Florida, Disney and Governor Ron DeSantis' allies have reached a settlement in their state lawsuit. Board members of the Central Florida Tourism Oversight District approved the settlement agreement during a meeting today. The settlement ends almost two years of litigation between Disney and the governor. It's centered around how Walt Disney World is developed in the future. The president of Walt Disney World Resort said in a statement today that the company was pleased about the settlement. He says the settlement opens a new chapter of constructive engagement with the new leadership of the district and serves the interests of all parties. A separate federal lawsuit that Disney filed against the Florida governor was dismissed in January. And a Democrat running on abortion access has flipped a House seat in traditionally red Alabama. Marilyn Lands emerged victorious in a special election to the Alabama legislature yesterday. Democrats celebrated Lands' victory in the suburban district of the Deep South State. They have, they have attempted to portray the state's GOP as too extreme on abortion. Alabama has a near total ban on abortion. and in vitro fertilization services were paused last month after a court ruling equated frozen embryos to children. The win was a rare victory for Democrats in the state. Republicans hold all statewide offices there and a lopsided majority in the Alabama legislature. President Biden's son Hunter will ask a judge today to dismiss a criminal case against him. He's accused of evading nearly one and a half million dollars in taxes. The younger Biden says prosecutors bowed to political pressure from Republican lawmakers investigating his father. Hunter Biden's lawyers will appear in federal court in Los Angeles to challenge the charges. They argue he was selectively targeted by prosecutors in response to Republican criticism over alleged earlier lenient treatment. Hunter Biden pleaded not guilty to failing to pay taxes between 2016 and 2019. This while spending millions of dollars on drugs, escorts, exotic cars and other big ticket items. 
His lawyer has said he paid back the money in full. The trial is due to start in June. And a January 6 defendant has won early release thanks to a Supreme Court decision. The Delaware man is serving a three-year sentence for marching through the halls of Congress during the 2021 Capitol breach. The High Court will review the Biden administration's unique use of an evidence tampering law. Hundreds of January 6 defendants have been prosecuted on felony obstruction of Congress under it. The charge carries a sentence of up to 20 years in prison. It is the most widely charged felony in January 6 cases. Kevin Seafried was one of the first people to enter the Capitol on January 6. He was convicted in June 2022 for four misdemeanors and a single felony obstruction charge. And over in Maryland, as the search for survivors and continues, search and rescue efforts have been suspended for six construction workers following the Baltimore Bridge collapse, uh, but recovery efforts continue. And as an investigation proceeds, many questions remain. Here to discuss with us is Brian J. Kavanaugh, visiting fellow at the Heritage Foundation, former senior director for resilience on the National Security Council and former FEMA, FEMA official. Brian, welcome. From a technical standpoint, are you surprised that this key bridge completely collapsed upon impact? Well, first, thank you for allowing me to join you and your audience today. But from a technical perspective, uh, the interesting thing is the ship's bow hit probably a structural weak point where the steel connects to the concrete pilings. Um, unfortunately, the result is the bridge collapse. And to me, it was not entirely surprising to see a catastrophic failure. Um, maybe more so surprising is that they did not use preventative measures underwater um, to prevent the ships from having an above water collision with the bridge. Uh, I know for a fact that those are used in Tampa after they had a similar incident a um, little over a decade or two ago. Uh, but in Maryland, those were not in place at the Key Bridge. And so how common are these kinds of measures around the, the country, do you think? As infrastructure is updated or new infrastructure is put into place, uh, that would be up to code. And, and those are probably more common. But as you get into these uh, infrastructure uh, pieces that are decades, several decades old, that, that technology, that uh, forethought was not in place uh, when these bridges were being built. So even just going back to 1972, when the Francis Scott Key Bridge was, was constructed. Right, and it said that the ship lost power moments before the collision. How common is that? So not very common, although it's interesting. I think last night some of the information that started to come out was they were gonna be looking into the fuel as a potential source for the engine failure, uh, which resulted in a loss of propulsion and a loss of steering. Uh, in the video, you clearly see the lights flicker on and off on the ship moments before uh, the collision. I think you have to give uh, credit to the captain of the vessel, the pilot for the Baltimore Harbor, uh, for notifying Coast Guard and MTA prior to the collision, which gave the MTA authority a chance to close the bridge to traffic. So this disaster could have been much worse. Yes, indeed. Uh, now, we've looked at some of the circumstances that led up to this, but what do you think should be or will be done next to identify all of the factors involved and what needs to be done to prevent this from happening. Absolutely. Well, I think the two investigating agencies that will have um, similar leads will be the U.S. Coast Guard and the NTSB. Uh, I think one of the things you're going to have to look at is what was going on with the diesel engine and whether it was the fuel. Um, I think I heard stories last night, as I mentioned, about dirty fuel being the possible culprit here. Uh, interesting to note that recently uh, vessels operating within 200 nautical miles of the U.S. Uh, for container vessels have to use a low emissions, low sulfur diesel, and then they switch to uh, regular diesel as they get out beyond that 200 nautical mile mark. And I, we should examine whether that initiative uh, to have a uh, climate resilience fuel actually spurred unintended consequences such as possible propulsion failure. Yeah, that will be an interesting point to hopefully get answers on. Uh, President Biden has said that he'll pay for the reconstruction of the bridge. How typical is that and, you know, compared to, say, the states taking care of it? I find that uh, remarks interesting. I, I think there's some historical precedents when you look at uh, 2007, President Bush uh, similarly stepped in and intervened for a bridge over the Mississippi. Uh, however, uh, when it's a not a natural disaster and a, a shipping vessel impacts the infrastructure, they should have insurance to cover that cost. And that's part of the industry standard. 
Uh, so I found that interesting that the president would lean in and, and articulate that they were going to pick up the pieces and fund the repair of the bridge. Absent congressional action, I don't believe the Department of Transportation is currently sitting on funds to do that. And I haven't seen the governor from Maryland request a emergency disaster declaration uh, to cover uh, repairs through FEMA. So I okay. uh, thought that was an interesting lead in and at, leads to more questions. Yeah, and just looking, just lastly, Brian, at the timeline, how long do you think it will take to get this bridge back up? I think the important thing to note is that they need to get the port open. Uh, the Baltimore port is responsible for about $3.2 billion in revenue for the Mid-Atlantic region every year. It's the ninth busiest port, and it provides access to inland uh, customers that the other ports take another day, day and a half to get to, if you're talking about Norfolk or Philadelphia or other ports. Um, I would think, imagine you're going to see four to six weeks of the port being closed. So that keeps 40 vessels trapped within the port. Uh, the, the cruise line industry is going to have to figure out how they shift gears. Do they have passengers in, right now currently in the Atlantic Ocean that they're going to have to figure out how to offshore and get them back to their residence? Um, from a commercial standpoint, I'd imagine the port's going to be closed for a month, month and a half. The bridge won't be replaced for well over 12 months, um, would be my guess. Wow, quite a few losses, not to mention potential for lives lost. Thank you so much, Brian, Jay Kavanaugh. Great to hear your thoughts on this. Thank you. Coming up, recovery operations continue more than 24 hours after the Baltimore Bridge collapse. NTD correspondent Luis Martinez has the latest from Maryland. Facebook is accused of secretly grabbing data from competitors in a cyber attack scheme. More on newly released documents in just a moment, here on NTD News Today. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost. Heavenly Father, I pray to you today to guide us tomorrow. Give us strength as we face death. Help us not to be afraid, as we know that we are going to be coming to your kingdom. Hey everyone, it's me, Sebastian, and it is a beautiful day today. We have so much to be grateful for, so just remember, if you see someone without a smile, Give them one of yours. I just love inspiring people to be the best they can be. And the reason I'm able to inspire so many people is because people like you who inspire me with your support of Shriners Hospitals for Children. Since I was little, I've broken a hundred bones and I've had 19 surgeries. Shriners Hospitals for Children was with me every step of the way. But more than that, They've given me the confidence to know I can do whatever I set my mind to. Like right now, I've set my mind to sharing my smile with you. Did you get it? Because of people like you, I can play the violin. Yeah. I can play piano. Yeah. I can Irish dance. The help I get is only possible because of caring people like you who pick up the phone and call the number on your screen to make your monthly gift. And when you call or go online right now to donate $19 a month or more, we'll send you this adorable Love to the Rescue blanket as a thank you and a reminder of all the smiles you're bringing to kids' faces every day. Kids like me. And me. And me. And me. So what are you waiting for? You can inspire kids like me by visiting loveshiners.org. After all, you can't help everyone, but you can help someone. So let's go! Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for giving. Join me and bring a smile to the world with your monthly gift today. Please call now. If operators are busy, please call again or go to loveshiners.org right away. 
Join me and bring a smile to the world. Washington State will no longer require that lawyers pass the bar exam. While nervous students may breathe a sigh of relief, what about the quality of legal services? Entity's Daniel Monahan spoke with a pair of attorneys for their take on the move. A state task force concluded last month that the test disproportionately blocks marginalized groups from becoming lawyers and said it is at best minimally effective for ensuring competent lawyers. The task force also cited what it called racism and classism it says is written into the test itself. The court approved three alternatives to the bar exam which are experience-based. A six-month apprenticeship with a lawyer plus three state-approved courses, 12 qualifying skills credits plus 500 hours of legal intern work, and a final option is for law clerks who don't go to law school, which includes standardized educational materials and tests plus 500 hours of legal intern work. Attorney Dean Broyles is skeptical. As with any profession that's dealing with people's health, safety, welfare, livelihood, finances, I think the highest standards need to be applied uh, to the bar and lowering the bar, so to speak, um, to benefit any particular group, I, I, I think is a dangerous precedent to set. The attorney thinks Washington state is going in the wrong direction. I don't think we want, for example, um, doctors um, operating on us who don't conform to the highest levels. And I think there's a similar degree of competency and excellence as, that's required of attorney. Attorney Vinu Varghese lectures at Harvard University. He sees the bar exam as a rite of passage. People should be able to have standards of becoming a lawyer and practicing as a lawyer. And to be honest, the bar exam isn't that difficult. Most people pass it the first time. Varghese draws a distinction between the bar exam and tests like the law school aptitude test or LSAT. Certainly you can look at the LSAT and say, well, what does that have to do with anything, right? But the bar exam tests your knowledge of law. I mean, it's not a, they're not giving you logic games. <laughs> Other things are asking you to, to figure out. They're just asking you, hey, what's the law on this? And this is the law that you're supposed to know in order to be a practicing lawyer. Varghese says if states like Washington want to help people, they could make law school free. Entrepreneur Vivek Ramaswamy addressed the issue on X a few days ago, saying meritocracy and equity are incompatible. America's founded on merit. The, the idea that the best person gets into college, the best person gets on the sports team, the best person for the job gets the job. Ramaswamy is calling on people to use their free speech to speak up. It's now more important than ever to stand up against those anti-meritocratic vestiges of the last five years. And that's going to be a big part of how we get this country back. Washington is now the second state to formally approve alternatives to the bar exam. Oregon is scheduled to enforce the change in May. Daniel Monahan, NTD News. It's been more than a day since the Dolly cargo, sh cargo ship crashed into Baltimore's Francis Scott Key Bridge. A recovery mission is now underway for the six people missing in the accident. Our reporter Luis Martinez is on the scene. Luis, great to see you. Now, what can you tell us about the victims? Well, like you just mentioned, as of late last night, this is no longer a search and rescue operation. It's a recovery operation. So the six people who remain missing are presumed dead. Uh, the six people who were missing were members of a construction crew working on potholes on the bridge when the uh, Dali struck the support beam of the Francis Scott Key Bridge and made it collapse. Uh, they're from several nationalities. It's reported that of the six people missing, there are Honduran, Guatemalan, and Mexican citizens. Let's listen to what Governor Moore had to say about the rescue operations. Well, first, our, our, our hearts go out to these families. Um, they, they are living a nightmare right now uh and so the when i told them that we would exhaust uh we would exhaust every single option for the search and rescue to try to bring them uh bring back survivors uh now that we've transitioned into uh into a, a recovery mission uh i promised them the same uh that i will exhaust all options to be able to bring them a sense of closure 
So I was just heard from Governor West Moore. Uh, they are focused on the recovery of the missing people and give closure to those uh, families. It's also important to note that uh, new information from the National Transportation Safety Board uh, suggests that, uh, well, uh, first of all, they boarded last night. Uh, they took the data recorder and began today interviewing crew members. We've also learned during uh, the day that the boat, the Dali, had also been uh, retained in the port of San Antonio in Chile late last uh, June due to propulsion issues. Let's listen to the uh, the chair of the National Transportation Safety Board, Jennifer Homendy, had to say about the investigation. Uh, well, right now, our work on scene, uh, and we have a team of 24 investigators, uh, various specialties, they are focused on collecting the perishable evidence. That is uh, all the documentation, including pictures and uh, components that we may need on the vessel or amongst the structure. Uh, to begin to conduct our investigation. With regard to analysis and really looking at the documents and digging into inspections and what occurred leading up to the striking, that will take a longer amount of time. So it's also important to note that it's been raining all day and that's been making recovery efforts more difficult. Divers did resume this morning uh, their search for, for the remaining missing people. And there's also a team of hazmat uh, uh, checking the containers on the Dali. The damaged containers from uh, the collapsed bridge might contain hazardous materials and they're inspecting for that. Uh, and it's definitely going to take a, a, several months to just clear the waterway. So as we've heard from previous guests, uh, the port of Baltimore will be heavily affected and the economy of the Northeast also. This is a port, uh, the second largest exporter of coal in the country, the ninth largest port in the country, also a big exporter of sugar and importer of everything from automobiles to toothbrush. So uh, it will be a very long recovery for the city and uh, the re region and we expect economic impacts in the following months. Back to you. All right, Luis Martinez in Baltimore, thank you. Texas is still not allowed to arrest and deport illegal immigrants. An appeals court is now extending a temporary hold on a controversial Texas immigration law. Texas asked the appeals court to let the law, known as Senate Bill 4, temporarily take effect while litigation continues. But the appeals court declined extending a temporary hold. A judge in the case explained the decision, saying immigration is not the job of individual states. She wrote, the entry admission and removal of non-citizens is exclusively a federal power. Texas can now theoretically once again ask the Supreme Court to allow the law to go into effect. The High Court previously declined to rule on the matter and gave jurisdiction back to the Appeals Court. The lower court is set to hold another hearing next week. And New York City officials on Monday started handing out prepaid debit cards to illegal immigrants. It's part of a $53 million pilot program announced by Mayor Eric Adams. The first batch of cards was given out to a handful of families. The mayor's office confirmed the program will expand to roughly 460 people by next week. City Hall said the cards can only be used at bodegas, grocery stores, supermarkets and convenience stores. Recipients must sign a pledge promising to use the cards only for food and baby supplies. But some have criticized the move, saying it will become an incentive for immigrants to enter the U.S. illegally. New York City Councilman Joe Borelli said providing illegal immigrants with services funded by taxpayers sends the wrong message. Mayor Adams insists the program is justified. He said it would alleviate a humanitarian crisis that has gripped the city. He said it would also save $7 million per year compared to city officials physically handing out food and supplies. The Romanian Mafia now reportedly coming to the U.S. and stealing from Americans. This by entering through the southern border. Fox News reports that the Romanian mafia is stealing from people in California using debit card skimmers. Suspects do this by placing a debit card skimmer over a store's credit card machine. Customers then swipe the fake skimmer instead of the, sk the credit card reader. An official with the Orange County District Attorney's Office explained the scheme. She said people sit outside a Walmart or a Target and it looks like they're panhandling. 
but they're actually using a Bluetooth device connected to the card skimmer inside the store. She said thieves get both the cash that people give them and the debit card number. The organization reportedly makes millions of dollars a month while working with other groups and cartels in Mexico. In Virginia, Governor Glenn Youngkin had a busy day yesterday dealing with gun-related bills. He vetoed 30 bills that he said would punish law-abiding citizens and impinge on their Second Amendment rights. Youngkin also signed 31 bills and suggested amendments to six. One vetoed bill would make it illegal to have a firearm at public colleges. Another would have mandated a five-day waiting period for gun purchases. Another would have banned open carrying of some semi-automatic rifles and shotguns in specific public areas. And another one of the vetoed bills <clears throat> proposed safe storage requirements for firearms in homes where minors or people not legally allowed to possess guns live. Some measures the governor signed aim to prevent parents from intentionally allowing children to access firearms if the child poses a credible threat of violence. And Facebook obtained secret data from competitors like Snapchat using a special program developed at CEO Mark Zuckerberg's request. That's according to newly unsealed court documents. This program ran from 2016 to 2019 and used cyber attacks to intercept and decrypt information from Snapchat, YouTube and Amazon. Facebook employees, including Zuckerberg, sought ways to get data on Snapchat's growth even if it was encrypted. The program involved installing software on users' devices to intercept encrypted traffic. A lawyer said the data influenced Facebook's product strategy and also hindered competitors' ad sales. Police footage shows a man being arrested on suspicion of stealing a front loader. The suspect led officers on a low-speed chase on several roads on Norcross, Georgia, Sunday. Eddie Sanchez can be seen driving away despite a police officer's attempts to stop the large vehicle. He's a former employee of the business the front loader belongs to. He was charged with criminal trespass, reckless driving, property damage and obstruction of a law enforcement officer. Gwinnett County Police said it learned that Sanchez was terminated from the business in 2023. They added that Sanchez visited the business several days before and did something similar but never left the property. Coming up, TikTok could be facing more trouble. Reports say the Federal Trade Commission has been investigating the platform for its data and security practices. Thousands of, thousands of people protesting in Hungary last night. The latest about an ongoing scandal regarding the government and child sexual abuse. We'll have the details soon when we return. Looking for a healthy and smooth tasting brew? Drop by Day's Coffee Roasters today and explore our wide selection of specialty grade small batch roasted coffee. Home to North America's first enzyme fermented coffee, we source a wide selection of specialty grade coffee beans from around the world and our baristas are ready to craft your customized brew. Visit Day's Coffee at 28 North Street, Middletown, New York. Come experience a brew like no other. If you're happy and you know it, clap your hands. If you're happy and you know it, ride your bike. If you're happy and you know it, then your face will surely show it. If you're happy and you know it, smile big and bright. Thousands of your kids, just like me, are happy every day. And it's all because of generous people like you who support Shriners Hospitals for Children every month. All you have to do is call the number on your screen or go online to loveshriners.org right now with your monthly gift. Because of people like you, Shriners Hospitals for Children is able to make an everyday miracle happen for kids like me. <laughs> If you're happy and you know it, play a song. If you're happy and you know it, then your face will surely show it. If you're happy and you know it, take a shot. 
when you call or go online right now to donate $19 a month or more, we'll send you this adorable Love to the Rescue blanket as a thank you and a reminder of all the smiles you're bringing to kids' faces every day. Will today be the day you send your love to the rescue? When you call the number on your screen right now and give as little as $19 a month, just 63 cents a day, you'll be making a life-changing difference for a child, just like Sarah. Your monthly gift today could change your life forever. Because of you. We are happy and we know it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Please call or go online right now to give. If operators are busy, please wait patiently or go to lovesrunners.org right away. Life doesn't always give you time to change the outcome. Pre-diabetes does. With early diagnosis, pre-diabetes can be reversed. Take the one-minute pre-diabetes risk test today. Go to doihaveprediabetes.org. We're in the nation's capital asking the important questions so that you're in the know. Join us daily, Monday through Friday, on the Capitol Report on NTD News. And we have more updates on the Israel-Hamas war. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu says international pressure on Israel will not work. I thought the U.S. decision on the Security Council was very, very bad. And the worst part about it, I think the bad thing about the U.S. decision in the, uh, in the United Nations Security Council was that it encouraged Hamas to take a hard line and to believe uh, that international pressure would prevent Israel from a, freeing the hostages and uh, destroying Hamas. Netanyahu says he's sending a message to Hamas. That is, international pressure against Israel will not prompt it to end the war without concessions from the terrorist group. This comes as Israel stands by its plan to conduct ground operations in the city of Rafah. The Israeli Defense Force says it has dismantled 20 out of 24 Hamas battalions. The military says it will return its focus on the four remaining battalions, which are believed to be in Rafah. Last night, Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin met with Israeli Defense Minister Yoav Gallant at the Pentagon and again urged Israel to abandon the plan. A foreign affairs strategic policy expert says a reshaped Middle East is transforming the world. How is the area evolving? Earlier, I spoke with Gregory Copley, president of the International Strategic Studies Association, to find out. Gregory, welcome, and it's great to see you. Now, you wrote an article on how the reshaped Middle East is transforming the world. Explain to us what is considered the Middle East. Can we define it? Well, that's been the problem. We've had all these different definitions over the years, some of them based on geography, some of them based on uh, Islam, some of them based on Arabic as a language. Uh, the reality is that the Middle East uh, has always been subject to many different definitions. But right now, it's undergoing new definitional uh, thinking for many reasons. Uh, one of them is that uh, the Middle East is now more integrated with the rest of the world than it has ever been in the past. Secondly, it is no longer about just Arabic as a language, nor about Islam, nor about the other languages of the region, which are uh, including Zoroastrian, uh, ism, uh, Christianity and Judaism and the like. So today we're now seeing uh, a, a much more cosmopolitan Middle East, even if you look at the old territories extending from, say, uh, the Atlantic shores of Morocco to the Indian Ocean shores uh, of uh, the Arabian Peninsula and uh, Iran, Pakistan and the like. Seeing How could the resolution and the end of the Israel-Hamas war could affect the Middle East? Well, I think that's almost a transitory issue. Yes, it's going to be uh, grabbing the headlines for a little longer, uh, but the reality is that uh, the, the, that war is a sideshow to the bigger picture, and it's partly a, an attempt by, for example, Turkey to claim a, a larger share of the trade going into and through the region and access to some of the reserves of oil and gas in the region. But, uh, but the reality is that that 
we, we, we keep getting sidetracked by these local issues. The Israel-Hamas war is not even one of the bigger wars in the world today. It's not as big in terms of conflict as the Ukraine-Russia war, certainly not as big as the war in Ethiopia, which in the last year alone has claimed about a million lives. So that's the biggest war in terms of de devastation, and that's part of the Middle East as well. But what we're looking at is how the Middle East becomes this hub uh, of, of global trade. Now, in terms of the U, from the U.S. perspective, the, there's, um, there's military leaders that's concerned about China building a super highway in the Panama Canal area. Um, now, are we seeing something like this of China developing in the Middle East? Absolutely. The uh, People's Republic of China has been attempting to build overland links to the Middle East through Iran, through Pakistan in particular, down into uh, the Arabian Peninsula and then across into Africa. Uh, what what uh, the Beijing has particularly done is build a, a super highway in a sense, and they're looking to build uh, pipeline and, and rail links across from Xinjiang in, in uh, southern China down through uh, Azad Kashmir, the, the Pakistani controlled area of Kashmir, through Kashmir down in the Karakoram Highway down to uh, Gwadar, the, the port which China has built in Pakistan on the Balochistan coast so that they can have a very sh much shorter shipping exposure down into either the Middle East or into Africa. That's not going very well at the moment because uh, that and the other programs of Chinese overland links, rail and road links through Central Asia uh, can no longer really be funded by the People's Republic of China, which has run out of cash. Gregory, thank you so much for your insight. We hope to see you again. Looking forward to it. Thank you. Another bomb threat yesterday and the threat of a mass shooting was sent to the headquarters of an established performing arts group in New York. Shen Yun Performing Arts, a U.S. arts group founded by Chinese dissidents, is a top priority target of the Chinese communist regime. The classical Chinese dance group depicts China before communism. Some of Shen Yun's dance pieces portray scenes of CCP persecution still taking place in China today, including forced live organ harvesting. Violent threats against the arts group seem to be escalating, with this being the fourth bomb threat now in just over a week. NTD's Jeremy Sandberg has the update. A new bomb and mass shooting threat was sent Tuesday to Shen Yun Performing Arts Headquarters in New York. A series of emails obtained by the Epic Times state in Mandarin multiple C4 explosives have been placed, demanding a $58 million ransom with a Wednesday deadline. The email threatens to detonate bombs and turn the headquarters into ruins if the money isn't sent into a PayPal account by 3 p.m. Then another email from a separate account makes a mass shooting threat and doesn't ask for money. That email also in Mandarin threatens in the near future, individuals will sneak onto the property, throw grenades, and shoot everyone on sight. Another separate email sent the same day launches into an expletive-laced rant, seemingly upset that Shen Yun reported the threats to police and media. The email chides the FBI and exclaims the agency isn't worth worrying about at all. The sender declares they will keep sending threats and eventually wear the police out with, quote, the boy who cried wolf. The email ends by threatening, then one day a bomb will really be put in a theater. This comes after weekend bomb threats in California and British Columbia at venues where Shen Yun was performing. The threats prompted evacuations and police bomb sweeps, but no explosives were found. A Shen Yun representative says the FBI has been notified and is investigating the threats. Jeremy Sandberg, NTD News. We've learned more about the U.S. customs officer who allegedly discriminated against Shen Yun artists at Chicago O'Hare Airport. Multiple artists said they heard the officer telling his colleagues the group is illegal for practicing Falun Gong. Customs and Border Patrol says it strictly prohibits profiling on the basis of race or religion. A Chicago nonprofit group is now calling for an investigation of the officer's conduct, alleging he used Chinese Communist Party hate propaganda in his official capacity. NTD's Jack Bradley has the details. We broke a story earlier this month at Chicago's O'Hare International Airport. A U.S. Customs officer whose last name is Ho, a Chinese immigrant from Beijing and is fluent in Mandarin, allegedly targeted the performers while they were re-entering the U.S. after touring in Europe. 
Officer Ho allegedly told the dancers that they were illegal because of their faith, even though they are U.S. citizens or hold legal visas. Officer Ho is still currently working at the O'Hare Airport. The Midwest Falun Dafa Association, which is the presenter of Shen Yun, is calling on U.S. Customs and Border Protection to investigate the incident. They said in a statement, we are deeply troubled by the discrimination and never did we anticipate that a federal government official, especially a customs officer, would delve into an individual's personal beliefs. Such conduct not only violates federal government policy, but also undermines the foundational principles of our nation, freedom of belief. A Customs and Border Protection Watch commander said that they're investigating the incident. Many of Shen Yun's artists have experienced persecution firsthand by the regime in China for practicing Falun Gong, also known as Falun Dafa. It's a meditation practice based on truthfulness, compassion, and forbearance, and it's been banned and persecuted in China since 1999. A Shen Yun vice president said that these threats are the Chinese regime's last-ditch effort to hide the truth. Members of Congress like Congressman Scott Perry and Michelle Steele have sent letters to the Customs and Border Protection demanding answers. Reporting from Washington, D.C., Jack Bradley, NTD News. More trouble could be lying ahead for TikTok. The Federal Trade Commission has reportedly been investigating the Chinese social media app and could sue it in the coming weeks. That's over alleged violation of a children's privacy law and for allegedly deceiving users by denying China had access to their data. The report comes from Politico, citing unnamed sources. Sources told CNN that officials are also investigating a potential violation of the FTC Act, which prohibits deceptive acts that affect commerce. So far, no official comment from the FTC or TikTok. This comes as there's a growing congressional push to possibly boot TikTok from the U.S. Earlier this month, the House passed a bill that calls for a TikTok's China-owned parent company, ByteDance, to sell the company or be banned in the U.S. This bill is in the Senate now. President Biden said he would sign it if it got to his desk. TikTok previously denied allegations that the platform is a national security threat to U.S. citizens. U.S. solar panel makers are hopeful to step up their competition with China. The Biden administration is touting a business deal as evidence that its subsidies are bolstering domestic solar manufacturing. Two small solar makers struck a deal today. The two manufacturers, one in Georgia, the other in Canada, will produce solar panels together. And solar project developers using their products can claim a 10% tax credit for using components made in America. But a report from the Financial Times says U.S. solar manufacturers are in a dire situation. That's because Chinese-made solar panels are flooding the U.S. market, driving prices to record lows. And even with Washington's tariffs and subsidies, American solar panels still struggle to compete with them. The chief executive of the largest U.S. solar manufacturer told the Financial Times that China does not want the U.S. to have its own domestic industry, adding that it's a pretty dire situation. And now we have some short headlines from Russia, Germany and other European countries. First, an update on the attack in Moscow. The president of Belarus, Alexander Lukashenko, said today the suspects actually tried fleeing to Belarus. They allegedly ended up choosing Ukraine only because they feared tight controls on the Belarusian border. Border units were mobilized and some military units instantly. Therefore, they could not enter Belarus in any way. They saw it. So they turned around and went to the section of the Ukrainian-Russian border. Russian officials on Tuesday said the suspects tried to escape to Ukraine. Moscow used this argument as proof of alleged involvement by Ukraine. Russia is still reeling from the Friday attack. Gunmen killed over 130 people in a music hall. Health officials said about 90 people remain hospitalized. Over 20 are in serious condition. A leadership shakeup in Ukraine yesterday. President Vladimir Zelensky d dismissed the Secretary of Ukraine's National Security Council, replacing him with the head of his foreign spy agency. The move follows the overhaul of the military high command last month. No reason for the change was given. Zelensky said the official was being transferred to new duties, with details coming later. The National Security Council has a coordinating role on security and defense issues under the president. 
It comprises the country's top political, security, and defense chiefs. Ukraine is battling to keep up its war effort and hold the line against attacking Russian forces in the east. Thousands of demonstrators gathered in Hungary last night. A former government insider released an audio recording allegedly proving that top officials conspired to cover up corruption. It's the latest development in a scandal surrounding Prime Minister Viktor Orban and other top officials in Hungary. Protests first began in early February. It was revealed then that Orban pardoned a man imprisoned for covering up child sex abuse by the director of a state-run orphanage. Close Orban allies were forced to resign due to public outrage. And Germany's economy is now expected to grow by much less than previously thought. Leading German think tanks have reduced their forecast for the country's economy this year. They previously expected 1.3% growth, but they're now slashing that to just 0.1%. The upturn in economic output expected last fall for the winter half-year has failed to materialize. All in all, the domestic economy has received little more than a tailwind. The German economy was, has struggled with increased energy costs after Russia invaded Ukraine. But also with high inflation. Similar to the U.S., the European Central Bank printed a lot of money during the COVID-19 pandemic, which led to higher inflation. Coming up, Texas, home of the NASA Johnson Space Center, launches a new commission to advance space exploration. That's as NASA gets ready for a total solar eclipse. And ahead of that eclipse, New York is giving out thousands of eclipse viewing glasses so people can protect their eyes during the rare event. That and more after the break. More than just beautiful dance. It's a touch of the divine. More than just legends. It's the beautiful culture and wisdom of China before communism. More than just a performance. It's an experience that awakens the soul. Lincoln Center, NJ Pack, State Theater, Purchase, and Stamford. Starting March 28th. Tickets at ShenYun.com. We've moved so far away from the Constitution that in many ways we don't even recognize it. In Hillsdale College's most popular online course, Constitution 101, you'll learn the principles of American government absolutely free at learnfromhillsdale.org. When you sign up, You'll enjoy 12 easy-to-follow lessons and learn to separate truth from fiction regarding the Constitution. To start your journey discovering the Constitution free of charge, go to learnfromhillsdale.org today. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a Just kids, hungry, homeless, and vulnerable. Abused kids often feel safer on the street. Now, more than ever, that's the most dangerous place of all. Covenant House is rescuing and protecting kids during this COVID-19 crisis. We're providing safe shelter to thousands, but the need is overwhelming, and no child is ever turned away. Please call or go online now with your gift of $19 a month to help a homeless child. You will provide safe shelter, hot meals, and medical care. Your gift will show our kids they're loved. Homeless kids are afraid and alone with nowhere else to turn. You want to know that there's somewhere you can go that's safe. So the Covenant House did that for us. Please call now. With your gift of $19 a month, we'll send you this soft, comforting blanket to show you're helping our kids. Please don't wait. In our national crisis, your gift is the lifeline a child needs. Please call or go online to safeplacetosleep.org now. Thank you. 
for saving precious lives. Texas is getting its own space commission. Today, Texas Governor Greg Abbott launched the program at NASA's Johnson Space Center. As many people know, uh, space and space exploration uh, is a rapidly advancing frontier. It's a green field for advanced communications and technology, for artificial intelligence, for robotics, for biotechnology, for supply chain solutions, and so much more. The governor said Texas will secure the future of space exploration for the next generation. April 8th will also mark a big day for millions of space enthusiasts in North America when the sky darkens during a total solar eclipse. NASA is preparing for the phenomenon for the first time in seven years. Eclipses have a special power. They move people to feel a kind of reverence for the beauty of our universe. Their power is not only to unify us on Earth, but to further science and discovery. Now remember, looking directly at the sun can lead to permanent eye damage. The eclipse is only safe to witness with the naked eye during totality. That's the period of total darkness when the moon blocks the sun. NASA scientists are also taking this opportunity to learn more about the disruptions the sun can cause to technology on Earth. The next total solar eclipse is set for April 8th in less than two weeks, and New York State is giving away thousands of free solar eclipse viewing glasses. It's first come, first serve, with a daily limit. I spoke to New Yorkers on what many call a once-in-a-generation phenomenon worldwide. We're at the Moynihan Train Hall, one of New York's 30 locations giving away these solar eclipse viewing glasses. And we're here we have Greg, one of the ticket clerks. And unfortunately, the glasses are all out as of today. So Greg, thanks for joining us. I mean, were you surprised by, by the demand of all this? Oh, absolutely. I was surprised. I didn't even know about the solar eclipse, you know? Everyone's acting like it's the end of the world. I didn't know about it until, like, Monday. So, you know, I guess I didn't get the memo. But, yeah, I was pretty surprised. They look like 3D glasses from the early 80s, and all these people, you know, getting them. I was like, what's going on? So 200 viewing glasses were basically given out in less than two hours this morning at the nearby station. Does that surprise you? No not surprised at all. Just the amount of people that were in Idaho, I could just imagine the amount of people that are going to travel all over, but Texas especially. The, so that doesn't surprise me at all. There's going to be a lot of people seeing it. Um, we're going down to, to Texas, Austin area with, with family to, to watch it because we hear that's actually the best, the best place to see it. I don't even know. I might give them away to like some my neighbor or something. I'm not really sure. I might be sleeping during the eclipse. But uh, <laughs> but now that you know, I have to learn more about it. You know. But again, I'm hearing some good things. So we'll you know we'll see what happens. Well, we saw it back in oh I don't the last one that was in like Idaho. I mean, my family drove up to Idaho to see it, and so we just decided plan been planning since then 2024 to go to Texas to see it because it was amazing. Yeah. So I mean. What did you remember seeing? Was it a total blackout or what, what happened? Yeah, it was a total blackout. We ended up going to a field where it was just us. And so we were able to see like the shadow coming towards us and it got like dropped like 20 degrees instantly. And like there was like a hawk that was down the road that all like freaked out because, you know, it changed drastically all of a sudden. But so it was amazing. What do you plan to do after? Uh, after just, um, I don't know, we'll just just kind of sit around and enjoy it you know there's there's always this moments where it's like oh we want to capture it on video or capture it on you know with, with the camera but then it's just like put the camera away and just enjoy the moment and be be in it and be present well, we'll be by a river we talked about like going and floating in the river we'll be by the colorado rivers and tell us about the the customers that or the the people that came by to pick up the glasses you said someone looked like they were coming up here like these glasses are hot commodity yeah Oh, yeah, like it was such a commodity. A guy was running, a guy came up to the window like Tyrannosaurus Rex was chasing him, you know? He wanted it so bad. And, um, you know, and I gave it to him. Thank God he, he just, he just made it. And he told me he came from, one guy told me he came from Westchester in a, in a car, in a, in a cab to like get the, I mean, I couldn't believe, honestly, or, or, or in all seriousness, I could not believe that. Came all the way from Westchester in a car, like, he said he paid an Uber to get here. And I was like, wow. 
So my cameraman Sean went back to the station and was able to get us a pair of glasses. Now back in 2017, that was when the last total solar eclipse happened and it was between two to three minutes in Illinois. But this year, it's supposed to last over four minutes in areas such as Texas and Indiana. Now looking through these eclipse lenses, everything is pitch black unless I look at the sun and it comes out as an orange speck. Reporting in New York City, David Lamb, NTD News. That is a good look, David. Oh, thanks. Next up, we have some updates from the animal kingdom. We start with an African Varose eagle owl, the king of a UK castle, preparing to take flight. Ernie has been flying twice a day at Warwick Castle to entertain visitors, but after 30 years in the business, he's retiring and he has certainly earned it. Ernie will perform a final flyover before passing the baton onto his younger successor, Bernie. At times here, there's up to 10,000 people here. It, it is a, an amazing place. So Ernie's just, I, I think, ready for uh, a, a few years of peace and tranquility. He's done such a good service. We seen him nearly 11 years ago. He definitely looks a little bit more weathered over there. A wise old man to teach Bernie. Wise owl, <laughs> wise old owl. I should have said that, yeah. <laughs> this wise old owl has earned his rest, a retirement to the Yorkshire Dales National Park in northern England. And in a zoo in Russia's Siberian region, two polar cubs are making their first steps in the snow. The cubs are blind, weak, and weighed only about a pound when they were born in December. Zoo staff say their mother's keeping them safe inside until they become stronger. She's watching them and feeding them. Staff and visitors say that the female cub is more active and curious, while the male seems calmer. Neither has a name yet, and the public is asked to submit their suggestions. Over in a zoo in western Germany, visitors are treated to a special sight. The zoo's animals went on an Easter egg hunt today. The animals enjoyed searching for food, and zookeepers are always coming up with new ways to keep them occupied. For a pair of brown bear brothers, the zoo made special edible Easter eggs. They have shells made from flour and water, and then filled with fruit and nuts. The zoo's southern pigtailed macaque and dwarf mongoose populations were treated to regular chicken eggs. They were painted in a variety of colors for the Easter celebrations. Very sweet. Well, that's all for today's news. Thank you for tuning in. For around the clock original news coverage, visit us at ntd.com or download our NTD app. And be sure to stick around for NTD Newsroom at 3 p.m. Eastern. We'll cover more stories from the U.S. and around the world.